You're listening to The Man That Can Project with Lockie Stewart, a global movement created to empower men and open up what's really going through their minds by having real and raw conversations about life's unique challenges and our individual ways of processing it all. Welcome to The Man That Can Project. Okay, welcome back to another episode of the Man That Can Project podcast. Thank you guys for joining us again. And it's been incredible to see what's happening with the podcast, especially over the last sort of three months. It's really uh, getting in the hands of people who need it. So thank you for your support. Today, I'm excited to have a good mate and someone who I've got a a lot of respect for who works in uh, in a similar field to me, Dennis Armfield. So welcome, Dennis. Thanks a lot, mate. Looking forward to it. Um, Always always good to talk to good people, mate. It's going to be fun. So... For those before uh, Dennis sort of dives in, Dan, Dennis, I was going to call you, I was going to, typical Aussie mate, I was about to abbreviate Dennis and just call you Dan. Uh, mate, call, me, call me whatever, I've been called a lot worse than Dan. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, typical Aussie slang there. Yeah. But uh, D- Dennis, you spent 10 years in the AFL playing for Carlton. I'm personally a, uh, you know, I only just got into AFL about eight years ago and I went to a game and it was Collingwood versus uh, Geelong and everyone said, don't go for Collingwood. So I bought all the Geelong kit and uh, been a Geelong supporter ever since. But a really good mate of mine who will definitely be watching this is a diehard Carlton, Carlton fan. Um, so he'll be frothing, frothing hearing from you. But big, big shout out to the Carlton boys. <laughs> Carlton <laughs> playing, playing 10 years of professional sport is huge, right? And along, along uh, the way in 2015, you won the AFL Jim, Jim Steins Community Leadership Award for your work, obviously, in the community with Odyssey House. Uh, Royal Children's Hospital and many other uh, sort of areas there, which, you know, I think it's incredible, especially, you know, we, uh, we don't hear about it a whole heap, but people who are thriving at the, the top of their field, but also doing a lot for the community. I, mean, I think that just speaks volumes about who you are as a, as a man and obviously, you know, what you've gone on to do in life after football, or even though you're still playing, but, you know, life after professional football. So, so it's, uh, it's good to see that. And, you know, now obviously since retiring, and we'll, we'll touch on this, a fair bit. You've helped start an organisation called the Business Fight Club, as you can see. For those who are watching the video, you can see on your your loud and proud, mate. Loud and proud everywhere. It's <laughs> awesome. But you're there to empower people to be proactive in life and to fight for for what matters most and be the best version of themselves. And mate, that's something I I believe in so much and how you go about doing it. And I've obviously been watching you on Instagram over the last 14 days as you've gone through and done your 14 day reboot challenge and sort of given a recap on each day. I think it's been, it's been very uh, cool to watch and just get different perspectives on how we can uh, restart or reboot, as you'd say, to get on track, especially, you know, through the times that we're going through at, uh, with COVID-19, but, you know, realistically you can reboot yourself at any, any day, shape or form. But mate, I'll pass it over to you. So, as we were touching on before, before I turned hit record, introduce us to to the man behind ten years at Carlton and all the other amazing things that you've done. Let us uh, let us into the world of Dennis. Look, mate, probably something that's not my strong forte. I'm a pretty um, humble person. I don't like to talk about myself all that much. So this will be short and sharp, that's for sure. So I hope, <laughs> you, I hope you got some uh, got some time filler in there. But um, now, look, mate, I um. Long story short, I was born in Canberra, mate. And my mum and dad split when I was a young fella, six years of age. Moved to moved to Perth, and my dad was a big rugby man, and um, I was always the sports sports jock, as they would say, mate. And um, grew up playing rugby union until I was about seventeen years of age in, in Perth. Um, my old man changed his changed his job, and unfortunately, uh, rugby training was about half an hour drive away, and I couldn't make training times so my old man being my old man is like you're not going to sit on your haunches and do nothing and and me being me it was like well I want to challenge myself and try something else and um a lot of my mates played this sport called football that I used to used to bag and not follow very much and um yeah from there I went down to the local footy training mate I was fortunate enough to play for Eastern Hills Hawks and the under 17s mate played a few games there where Swan District's identified me and they're a club in the Western Australian Football League um, and they sort of got me down and 
said, yeah, for the next five weeks, you're not going to play any games. You're just going to train, train, train and train. Um, we see aspects of your game that can really um, help us as a football club, but you've got a lot of aspects of your game that you need to work on. And from then, mate, I was like, well, I'm very driven. I'm very um, passionate about being the best I can be. And I think that's the key there, the best I can be. And yeah. I never really had an ambitious goal from that day to make AFL. All I had was, well, I've got a goal now to play the next level, which at that stage was Colts in, in the waffle and then try to progress to reserves, to try to progress to the league and just keep going as good as I could be. And I was fortunate enough to play Colts. And then in 2004, it's gone far out, it's a fair while ago, <laughs> I, uh, I was in, in my year 12 and um, I was very, uh, very disciplined with my schooling. And my dad always taught me like, as long as you go well at school, I'll let you do anything. As long as you're going well at school, like it'll open doors for you. And I still believe that to this day. Um, but I think the thing that it taught me the most is if you're willing to stick at something, if you're willing to dig deep, if you're willing to push yourself, if you're willing to sacrifice some things to, for the betterment of others, um, you can achieve anything. And I wasn't the smartest tool in the shed, that's for sure. Um, but I really did discipline myself. You know, I remember studying for my year 12 exam and, I'd do eight hours straight of just reading maths books and because I was someone that was read, write, read, write, read, write to learn. And um, so year 2004, I actually left Swan Districts and thought, stuff it, I'm going to go and play local football. And um, my dad was pretty pretty flat with me because um, it was like you're giving away a dream. To, But I was like, well, my year 12 means so much to me. I, I didn't want to dedicate myself to being busy at football. Um, so I chose school and... When played local footy, it was one of the best years of my life, mate. I um, enjoyed it. It was great fun playing like senior football and Colts football for a local football team um, at Kalamunda. And then um, I finished my um, uni. I finished year 12 and got into uni and was fortunate enough to get into physiotherapy. Um, and I was just going to just stay at local football. But my old man sort of said, no, don't, don't waste it and, and go back to what your, your real passion is and that's about being the best you can be. Um, and so I wanted to push myself against the best. So Swan Districts invited me back down, which is fortunate enough for someone to say no and then to get another invite back. Um, and yeah, the rest is history, mate. I, I put my name in the draft. I missed out twice. In my third and final year in the draft, I didn't expect to really get picked up. There was rumours that maybe Carlton or maybe West Coast is a rookie. Um, but I didn't really believe a lot of rumours. And then I was just doing my thing at Swan Districts and um, was fortunate enough to, yeah, get picked up at, at Carlton Footy Club. Um, and then two days, or the next day, actually, I was on a flight all the way to Melbourne. And then there's the 10-year career there, mate, which has been, was been surreal, the amount of people, the opportunities that are open for me. Um, but again, I just went there just to be the best I could be, not really setting any real hard goals on myself. I wanted to play one game and then it was play my second game and then it was push myself and push my limits to, to wherever I could get to. That was all up here. Um, I don't think anyone else can control where I could get to. It was in my body and in my head. And um, Yeah, I was fortunate enough to, like you said, win the Jim Steins in 2015 for community work. But I think that was instilled in me as a young age from... My grandmother, which was you know, my motto, live to give. And I think I was in an opportunity, opportune position to yeah, give back to people. Um, you know, Dennis Armfield off the street that walks in probably doesn't get the reception that Dennis Armfield, the footballer, did. So I wanted to make the most of that as well, to be able to give back to those that might not always um, be centre of attention, mate. So, um, and then, yeah... Uh, Played some, played some football for 10 years, mate, and the rest is sort of history. And now I'm just a washed up hack sort of sitting here doing <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Mate, for you, like to, so is it normal? I don't know like about a whole heap about the drafting system, but yeah. is it normal to sort of get knocked back and put, put your, I guess, your name in the hat three times? Or do most people generally give up after the one or two knockbacks? <laughs> it's probably an interesting one, mate. I, um, back when I got drafted, which was 2000. And um, seven, the end of 2007, um, <clears throat> the mature age probably wasn't as prominent as it is now. Uh, yeah. You see a lot more mature age recruits these days, um, which tends to another argument, but I won't go there. But um, yeah, when I missed out the first two years, 
my second year, I was probably more expecting to go. I thought I had a good enough year to be picked up and I was only tw- uh, 19 at the stage. Um, yeah, so, uh, but in my third year, I sort of probably freed the shoulders a little bit. I had so much pressure and expectation on myself in the previous two years that I was, I was probably doing things for other people and I wasn't doing them for me. And in my third year, I thought, stuff it, I'm just going to enjoy the game of football again, get my passion back live in the moment, not worry about what's happened, not worry about what could happen. It was just about worry about what I'm doing. Um, you know, so I sort of broke my football game pretty much into into quarters, really, um, for the whole year. Um, and, yeah, in the third year to get picked up as a, well, I was 20, but it turned 21 a couple of weeks later. So, for realistically, for a 21-year-old to get picked up um, back then was pretty rare, but wasn't um, like I was some superhero or anything like that. It was just... Um, I think, yeah, determination, de- dedication and discipline, I think were three things that I definitely have and, and definitely live with. And I think if it wasn't for those, plus a great support crew around me, uh, giving up time, you know, I, I didn't have my licence, so I had mates picking me up, taking me to and from training, to and from games. And, you know, I joke about it now, but, you know, back then you sort of just take it for granted a little bit. And, you know, these people have like genuinely helped me get to where I am. So, you know, I don't go a day without thanking them. But, um, yeah, it's it's an interesting one, mate. But uh, like I said, it's sort of like a lot of people do it. So I'm not really that special, mate. I think you're definitely one of the most humble people I've met, that's for sure. <laughs> oh. did, did you find at any time, like, you know, obviously being 21 as well, or 20, 21 and still getting in the big leagues, like that's a lot of people's dreams I would imagine did you ever find at any point it did start going to your head or were you sort of always that level headed and you know your life motto which I definitely want to talk more about yeah in a minute like live to give did that did that always sort of lead you where you wanted to go it's a good question mate like um it's funny I I probably reckon in my AFL career there was probably three or four different dentists if I'm honest um when I was young um, and first there, I sort of said, no one gets in my way. I don't give it. I didn't care if you were Chris Judd or whether you were the first round pick. Like if I was there, ball was there. I didn't care if I hurt you. I didn't worry about those things. I just knew one way, and that was go hard or go home. Really, um, which sounds like a great attitude, but when when it's your teammates and stuff, it can sometimes be detrimental. Um, and so when I was young, I was probably like that. Then I started to live, like figure out how to. How do I make myself better, but also make other people better? Um, so I sort of found that sort of middle ground. Then I probably had to knuckle down because I was pretty pessimistic in my thinking. I was always like, I'll get dropped. I'll be, I won't get picked. Always expecting the worst. And then if anything happened, I'd like celebrate it. Um, yep. Whereas I sort of, but I was getting those results and it's funny, mate, whatever you think, nine times out of 10, you're pretty right. So um, when I said I'd get dropped, I probably did get dropped. When I said I didn't, wouldn't get picked, I wouldn't get picked. And probably sort of, you know, the definition of stupid, stupidity is doing the same thing, expecting different results. And so yeah. there was a stage there where I started to try to work on my mindset, get a bit of a growth mindset and change my thinking a little bit. And that sort of helped me, but I, I sort of went insure a little bit, like I worried about me. And then, in my last part of the career, mate, and, you know, I might have finished my career a little bit earlier than maybe, but um, I could have had, hang on a little bit longer, but I became probably more preoccupied with making sure everyone else succeeded and, and sort of pushed my success to the side a little bit, which I don't regret at all. I don't, because um, I've seen some young kids now that are playing some really good football for that football club and other clubs that I've had an influence over and that, and that, gives me a big smile, mate, and a good pat on the back too. So, yeah, when you ask about have I always been this way, it's probably been a bit of a roller coaster, mate, if I'm honest. But I've always tried to figure out, like, um, yeah, how do I I make the best of a situation and what do I need to do to to not only help me but to help the football club at the time and to to help those that are part of that football club at the time. Yeah, that's awesome, mate. So when you, you also, the three Ds that you touched on, determination, dedication, and discipline, was that yep. something that you, once again, like you said, you obviously have had it for a long time. Was it something you learned or you, you just 
developed over time through your own, I guess, challenges and obstacles or how, how did that sort of come about for you? Probably both, mate. Um, my old man, I was a little fella. I was always skinny, mate. I was probably like 40 kilos dripping wet as I was growing up. <laughs> I was a yeah. fella. Um, and my old man used to always, you know, push me, but in a good way, like in a supportive way. Um, yeah. And always just said like, you've got to be able to put your head on the pillow at night knowing that you gave it all. Um, and, and that was with everything, school, footy, friendships, anything that I did. Um, and it was, it was probably something that, you know, I remember I was a little fella and would play British Bulldog, you know what that is. And he'd put me out the front and pick the biggest bloke, the biggest prop in the, in the list and go, right, run. And I had to tackle him. And if I didn't run again, and if I didn't <laughs> run again, and, as, as bad as that sounds when you sort of think about it, you go, right, hey, Dad, thanks for bullying me. But um, it sort of instilled this um, character in me that you'll figure a way out, you'll figure a way to do it. And my way of figuring it out is his ankles were no bigger than my ankles. So I had to go there. That was the only chance for me to, to get the, the big fella down. And, um, and, and But that sort of d- determination to sort of go, you know what, I can't give up. And, and it's something that I'm forever grateful for because right now we are doing it tough, mate. You know, I've been influenced by this coronavirus as has everyone else, mate. And it's about, well, you know, what am I going to do? I can sit here and go, poor me and look to play the blame game or I can sit here determined and find a way or find another avenue or, you know, look for the ankles, you know what I mean? And um, yeah, so the three Ds are probably something that I've developed over time. Um, and you, you sort of take away, as I grow up, you sort of start to actually look for the areas where you learnt these. Yep. Uh, whereas when you're young, mate, you just go, go, go. And um, yeah, you, you know, you're disciplined and all that to, to stick to it, stick to a plan, stick to a game structure to execute that, you know, no matter what's thrown in front of you. The, the discipline to get up on a Sunday morning at, seven o'clock to go for a beach swim when you wanted to go out the night before and and things like that. And, you know, when some of your mates are doing X and you've got to do Y um, and I'm not saying what's right or wrong. It was just, that's what I had to do. And that's what other people will have done as well. And um, yeah, it sort of puts you in a good spot and I think it's helped me get to where I am and it'll probably help me get out of some tricky situations as as well in the future. It's cool that you can take, a lot of those lessons from sport and start implementing them into, you know, your business and other areas of your life. Yeah. I think um, a lot of people don't realize how much experience they really have from other areas of their life. And when we get into a certain situation in the future, we panic and feel like it's the first time we've sort of dealt with anything like that. But, you know, a lot of us have a lot more um, experience than we believe. And that's why I think it's awesome that you took those learnings from our footy and implemented uh, implemented them into other aspects of your life. Before we sort of dive into the business bike club, because I'm excited to talk more about that and what that journey has been like, obviously, especially now um, with what's going on and how you're pivoting and shifting. Like what was the transition like going, like sort of the, the moment that you made the decision to retire and then sort of transitioning into that next phase of your life? Because as, as I was sort of touching on before, we see most <laughs> they, people can't handle it a lot of you know athletes really struggle with that transition but you seem to have done that really well and yeah from the outside looking in but you know and you know one thing I keep circling is like that live to give like obviously you're constantly coming from a place of service so maybe that has taken some of your focus and attention but I'd love to sort of hear more about how that went for you it's um if I'm honest mate I probably wanted to retire a year earlier than I did um But in conversations with my wife, um, there was nowhere near, I was nowhere near ready. Uh, Financially, mentally, um, you name it, I wasn't ready. Um, And I wasn't, I wasn't probably in a mindset to give up on what was football. Um, So in speaking to my wife and a few other people, mentors and that, that I've I've looked up to throughout my career, I was like, right, I need to knuckle down for another year. I need to prepare myself better. I was halfway through a podiatry degree and um, I was like, right, I've got to knuckle down into that. I've got to pick the brains of people that are 
in the real world, as we'd sort of say. Um, I've got to learn. I've got to grow. I've got to. I've got to just make myself like this big sponge of for twelve months. And so I was a lucky enough to get another contract, which was you know was, which was great in the, in the first point. So that was point one ticked. But that next year, mate, I I literally just tried to be a sponge. I would do a lot of my community work at Odyssey House and and pick the brains of both the residents and for those that don't know, Odyssey House is a drug and rehab, um, drug and alcohol rehab set like house, uh, <clears throat> helping people to rehabilitate back into the real world. And, um, you know, I'd learned so much off them just about hardship, what they've gone through, decision making, um, what it's like out there, I guess, um, the ups and downs and that, you know what, you can make a mistake, but come back stronger and better than ever. And, you just need to get given that opportunity and I'd speak to business people and contacts through the Carlton Football Club, you know, which we're very lucky to have that just about life and what do they do and experiences. I was knuckling down to my uni degree and um, trying to squeeze as much as that out as possible, um, which was pretty hard to then also play football at the same time. Um, but yeah, when the transition came, mate, and retirement was the decision to, to make. Um, wasn't an easy one. I, um, a lot of people, especially Carlton fans, probably would have seen me blubbering towards the boys, mate. It was probably one of the hardest things I've had to do to sort of announce that you're retiring. And if I'm honest, mate, the hardest part for me was the, the like self worth and the self title. Um, you know, it, it wasn't that I did it for for a title or I didn't do it to be a superstar and I didn't do it to be famous, but. You know, when I was six years old, I was known as Dennis Armfield, the quick runner, Dennis Armfield, the rugby player, Dennis Armfield, the t-ball player, Dennis Armfield, the sports this, Dennis Armfield, this. Then it was Dennis Armfield, the current footballer. And then all of a sudden, when you put that signed, sealed and delivered and put it on the shelf, it's like, who am I? You know, like, what am I now? And I think a lot of people live for the business card title. And mm. it's something that I soon realised that, hang on a minute, there's so much more to me than just that title that's written next to my name. And... You know, I'm a husband, I'm a, a, a mate, I'm a son, I'm a nephew, I'm an uncle, you know, and you sort of sit there and you go, well, I'm also just another person that can help other people. And um, when I transitioned, I, I was pretty fortunate that, first of all, I, I met a, a great guy who is, is my boss um, in Jeremy Thomas, and he took me under his wing a little bit and helped me. I wrote a transition book. Um, and it was more for me to help myself get through it. Um, just about all the things in that I was dealing with with transition and a lot of the things that we forget that we learn through through sport or through life that we can actually use during our transition. Um, and I surrounded myself with people that I could have hard, honest conversations with um, that would help me get through it, you know, and support me through it. So I was fortunate enough that I had a lot of boxes ticked. Um, and I was, again, you go back to your three Ds and I was fortunate enough to live them while I was in transition. And mate, if I'm honest, um, it probably took me, you know, I remember round one, Richmond versus Carlton, the following year after I retired, mate, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't watch it. I broke down. I was like, that was me. I'll never play in front of that again. I'll never do that again. Like, And it took me some time, but... I was fortunate enough to obviously business fire club and be part of this, to be living a life that I'm passionate about, to still be helping people to be grateful for what I have in my life. Not so much what I didn't have or have lost or anything like that. It's about what I have. And I, I spent a lot of time, you know, just working on me and who I am and where I want to go and what I want to do. And um, yeah, now I'm sort of, I think two and a bit years going on three years out now. So yeah, it's sort of like sort of weird to look back and, and think of that. It's now I'm on to the next thing and I'm really excited by that. That's awesome, man. That's powerful to hear because you very rare, or for me personally, like it's very rare that you get to hear that side of what it's like for, you know, all the stuff that's going through the minds of someone when they're transitioning into a different chapter of their life. Like obviously, you know, you always see in the tabloids, especially with athletes, you know, they've done this wrong or done that wrong and it's like we're still all humans and we we mm. process things or we don't process things but it, it's you know it is a acceptance that it isn't your who you are as you as you said you've, there's so much more to 
you know, Dennis and you know, and mm. you know, the rest of the world knows. So it's exciting to see you sort of um, continuing to keep that high standard and do it, put it into other aspects of your life. It's fucking awesome, man. It's very inspiring. Um, and I'm sure, you know, the people at Carlton and all those young fellas are, are still looking up to, which is awesome. It's just the beginning, but one thing you, you sort of said as well, like to help you help yourself get through it, you're investing in yourself. Like I always talk about like the first time I was asked to invest in myself, it was, um, I just moved back from France playing rugby and a guy said, mate, come to this event. It's 25 bucks. And I was like, nah, that's a carton of beer, mate. Not a chance. And, uh, I ended up doing it because I had a lot of respect for this guy and uh, it changed my life. And ever since then, you know, the investments, whether it's time, um, effort, energy, money, whatever it is, has been the greatest things that I've ever done because, you know, you're constantly learning more about yourself and where you want to go and how I can be better and help more people. How has um, investing in yourself improved your quality of life and helped you get to where you are today? Oh, mate, if I'm honest, it's probably been the biggest thing in my life um it's funny we um we talk about investing in businesses investing in stock markets and set, investing in all of these different things and uh, ideally i sort of changed my mindset a little bit probably when i was in the mid-20s sort of to realizing that you know what dennis armfield is an entity dennis armfield is a business and realistically without this business there is no other businesses, whether it's work, relationships, friendships, you know, there is nothing else. So I sort of started to realize, well, I've got to invest in this business and this business to ultimately be able to give the best to the other businesses that are out there and be that at work, be that with my, my wife, be that with my mates, be that with anyone in between, you know, the people that I'm helping at Odyssey house or anything like that. It was like, if, if, if my business isn't operating strong, well, I ain't going to give my best to anyone else and they're not going to operate strong. And I did a lot of work, mate, in, like I said, I had a pretty fixed mindset. I was pretty like, it's this way or, you know, it's my way or the highway, you know, this is the only thing that's going to work for me. Yeah. You don't know me. I know myself better than anyone. And I then sort of tried to change that and sort of realise that, you know what, you can learn so much from so many people and it doesn't necessarily have to be an AFL footballer. It doesn't have to be, you know, a guy that runs a great podcast that's out there to try to help you. It can be a person that you pass on the street that you have a two second conversation with. And I started to just look for ways to learn. And it's funny, mate, I got through all of school without reading one book. Um, even in English, I winged it somehow. Um, I got through and now, mate, like I've been in isolation for, yeah, 15 days or, you know, we've been in lockdown, sort of not lockdown, but in our house for 15 days and I've already read three books. And, you know, like it's, it's, it's something that I've, I'm passionate about doing. And, you know, some of these books, mate, have given me one thing and I've read 400 pages for one thing, but, you know, that one thing's made me better and, and vice versa. And, um, you know, I sit there and, gratitude something that we often forget and especially in crisis we always go to the things that we don't have or the things that we've suddenly lost or that but we forget so many good things in our life and we forget like you know in our program in one of our programs in fight club like we speak about the golf shot theory and for those that have played golf you can go out there and hit 100 shots 100 plus you know and you still come in at the last hole with your mates and you chat about that great drive or that great chip or that putt that went in from a mile away and you, that's what drags you back to golf the next time. Yep. And I sit there though, and in life, and I was one of these, mate, I sat there at the end of the day, end of a game, end of anything, and sort of went, oh, I didn't achieve that. I missed that. I didn't do that. I didn't do this and I didn't do that. And in life, we hear so often about missed KPIs, our weaknesses, areas that we've got to get better. And that's fine. We want to hear that and we want to get better. We want to get stronger. But don't forget the things that you have done well, the one good conversation, the one meeting, the, the handshake of a mate, the hug of a friend or a cuddle of your wife or whatever, the little things that we often forget and because they're the things that are going to make you get up tomorrow morning and do it all again, you know, not the, not the bad things because why would you want to get up and do it all again? You know, these are things that I've had to work on and still continue to work on, you know. I, I, I'm not losing sight that I've still got plenty of growth and I'm not hundred percent right and no one is. And I've never yet met a person that's perfect and that's fine. 
we're not aiming for perfection. What we're aiming for is to be the best I can be, you know, and that's all I can ask. If I can put my head on the pillow and wake up the next day and say, yep, right, sweet, I was good that day and I'm going again, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. And I think um, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm, I'm going to fall back into some old ways at times, but it's about giving myself the time to actually take a breath. Where am I at? What am I doing? Where do I want to go? And attack it again, you know, whereas in the busyness of the world that we live in, we just keep lugging that sack full of rocks, 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 mate, and keep on charging. And I sit there and go, there comes a time where you've got to go, I need to sit down, get rid of some of these rocks. Otherwise, I'm, I'm fighting an uphill battle right away, you know. So it's something, mate, that I think um, working on myself has been something I'm very passionate about, um, something I... I've found my ways and that's the crucial thing. I think you've got to find your ways to do it, but I think you've got to be willing to actually do it. And, you know, like you said, I, I was the same, mate. I was like, I've got 25 bucks, mate. I'm going to play a game of golf or buy a new golf ball or something. I'm not going to buy a self-program or a book or, or yep. something where I could learn, mate. But, yeah, I soon changed my ways and realised that this is that sacrifice, this is that discipline, determination, you know, that I, that I need to show. I loved how you put it into perspective. It is the business that we need to work on. Like, cause I think a lot of us lads relate to our business. We're all, you know, we want to be that provider protector or, you know, be successful in our career. So when we look at our mind and our body being a part of that business and really doing that inner work, that motivates me to want to do more of it makes sense. Yeah. It just clicked for me then, which is good. <laughs> yeah, well, hence the name, mate, why we said business fight club, you know, everyone goes business what the hell business? Like, do you only help business people? And we're like, we're all business people because we've got one big business here and here. You know, these are our businesses. And I think if we can come to terms with that and you sort of sit there and you see businessmen and the amount of hours they put into their business, the amount of hours they put into staff, the amount of hours they do behind closed doors and push their body to the extreme at what expense, you know? And I sit there and go like, put hours in that into this because without this, there ain't anything else. So I know where I'm going to put my time and it doesn't mean I don't do the other things. I can't just come and sit at home and look at myself for five hours of a day and call that a job, mate. But, you know, it, I give myself the opportunity at the end of the day or the start of the day or partway through the day just to take a deep breath and go, right, we're all good. Yep, we're all good. Let's go again. So moving, like what for you made you want to get into Business Fight Club? Like what? you know, you probably had a number of opportunities of things to, to do or, you know, other things that you were interested in. What made you sort of go down that path? Um, probably like-minded people, for starters. When I met Jeremy and all the crew that's behind Business Fight Club, like um, you could just see they had a passion to create change and a passion to, to help others. And, and that's something that's important to me. Like I said, my motto, live to give. Um, but I think the thing that sort of started to resonate with me is, is again, Mate, I love seeing people smile. I love seeing people happy. I love seeing people laugh. I'm, Mate, I'll... that just brought up a memory for, for me. As soon as you said, said that, sorry, I'd segue. Ah, when, we were, when we were at that uh, Lululemon event and you just were in a circle. Yeah. Right, and you just stood up and just dropped it. So <laughs> the intention of, for those um, listening, we were doing a circle and we all had to introduce ourselves and, you know, what was it, a two-minute... Uh, yeah. two minute introduction to who we are and what we stand for and you've just jumped straight up ripped your shirt off ripped your pants off standing there in your jocks mate it was the the most entertaining but engaging uh speech i've ever ever heard like it, for you to do that in amongst a random blo uh, group of lads as well straight away was phenomenal but anyway going back, that sort of tied into smile and yeah i look mate and like i said like um we've all got our own intricacies and our own personalities and I think I encourage people to keep bringing them to the table mate and you know the reason why I get down to me jocks and that is the, the story behind that mate is I am who I am and this that was me I was, if there weren't women in the room mate I probably would have got nude and I wouldn't have cared but um it's more about you know I'm going to be open and honest and real and all I'm asking is for you guys to be open and honest and real with me and that was the whole point of that and I think that's why passion I sit there and I go like well, if you want to break it down to stats, mate, six men take their life every single day in Australia. And I sit there and go, 
we need to change because we can't have six men take out like taking their lives every single day. I sit there and go domestic violence. Most of the causes of domestic violence are us men. And it's because we wait till it's too late and we snap. And I sit there and go, if we work on our business at an earlier time, if we work on what maybe is making us feel that way, if we're not scared of having the awkward conversation, we won't have to use our fists, our hands or anything like that. And, you know, I don't want any woman hurt. I don't want any woman to feel unsafe. I don't want any man to hurt, to get hurt. I don't want any man to be unsafe. I sit there and go, we're only as strong as our weakest link. And I said, well, let's, let's lift that weak link, mate, and let's get everyone up to an even playing field where we can start to support one another, love one another and fight for one another. And that's why Business Fight Club, mate, because it's about fighting for yourself to then fight around your environment and fight for those people that you actually care for, fight for the things that you actually want in life and start treating people how you want to be treated and don't be afraid of the, the awkward conversation in between. And I think when I walked into you know, Business Fight Club and the crew that was there, it was like, this is what I am. This is who I am. I'm not afraid to be real raw and wrong. I'll be wrong at times. There's no doubt about that. But again, I'm willing to be wrong. I'm willing to step out, take a risk and, you know, see what happens. And I, I sit there and go, that's why. I want to see more happy people living in this world, mate. You know, I want to see people come out of this coronavirus and, and not have to freak out and, you know, I don't want suicides. I don't want this. Men, women, kids, anything in between. I don't want bullying. I don't want all of this. But one little fella in a big world ain't going to do a lot. But I'll try to spread the message, mate, as you are, as a lot of other people are. And it's great to see. And I just hope more and more people start to change. Yep. And I'm 100% with you. And I know there's a big rally of people uh, trying to help, as you said, raise that weakest link so we can all be on an even playing field uh, yeah. where people don't feel the pain. You know, obviously hurt people hurt people. And Mm. I, I'm the same as you. I fucking hate getting, I hate it, but I love being on the phone or, or in person with someone who, you know, they're in pain and we have the ability to help them help themselves, which is, is so powerful. So how does, how does that sort of work for you guys? Like obviously, you, you know, you're doing the, you just finished uh, the 14 day reboot. Mm. What the hell is that for people who, who aren't stalking you on Instagram? Like I am. <laughs> yeah. Look, um, well, obviously, with the whole coronavirus, we have our main two programs are our women's program, which is called Wonderment, and our men's program, which is called Best Man. It's a 15 module, which is usually we try to get a module a week of about an hour, an hour and a half of work. A week. It's not a lot of stuff to invest in. If you, you know, if you looked at yourself as a business and all you said, I'm giving myself an hour a week, you probably yeah. slap yourself a little bit. So <laughs> it's not a lot of work. But what we sort of thought was, you know, that's only $97. And, um, because we want to help as many people as possible. We want to spread the word. We want to get it in the hands of as many men and women as possible. But what we thought was with coronavirus and the world changing and all that, with many of us not able to leave our houses or we're working from home or, you know, you can only catch up with one person at a time and it's usually your household anyway. Um, it was like, well, how do we help people in this time? How do we, how do people use this time to, to invest back in themselves, to, to reboot and make sure that they have a pathway out of this. And um, that's where we created the 14 day reboot program, you know, the isolation program, which was, it's $9.70. So, you know, like we've, we've made it as cheap as possible where we're not doing it to make millions, mate. We're doing it to help millions. And, um, you know, it's two coffees and I sit there and go, it just tests people, you know, it's 14 days. It can take longer, you know. We try to encourage 14 days on seven topics because while you're in isolation, we've, got, we've suddenly gained more time, even though we haven't, but we've just suddenly gained yeah. more time. Um, and it's just getting people to sort of realise, like, work on gratitude, work on their, their mindset and, and hopefully having a growth mindset, you know, working on social connections while in isolation, like... Um, you know, I've seen more of my mates' faces in the last two weeks than I have in yeah, the last two yeah. years, you know. So, you know, um, what, what are the opportunities that come from this? What is the good that can come from this, you know? Um, what are you doing to be mindful? What are you doing to, to be present in the now? And just challenging people on, yeah, seven topics to, to ultimately just fight for themselves, to, to invest in themselves, to use their time wisely because we can sit there and, you know, I've done it, but we can sit there and watch Netflix and chill and we can sit there and, you know, 
just be aimless or we can have a purpose and be driven and, you know, we can invest in ourselves and stop and give ourselves the opportunity to reflect on where we are, where we've come from and, and where we want to be. And, you know, for 14 days of work, which most of us can give up and it's probably made 30 minutes a day, you know? So again, it's not a lot of work and I, I, I doubt no one will get nothing from it. Someone, you'll get something from it for $9.70 that'll help you during this time. And um, yeah, I just encourage people to, whether it's my program or not, but I just encourage people to really stop and reflect and, and use this time wisely uh, to I, attack what is part B after coronavirus. I th that's so cool, man. I love how uh, it's not to make millions, it's to help millions. And <clears throat> going back on what I said before, like for me, my first investment in in personal development was a book well i got gifted the book but then that 25 dollar ticket for 970 mate people is here's one thing that i do and i always do i do on a daily basis right i love music i love spotify i love how good it makes me feel but before i'm allowing myself to listen to music and get that feel good buzz i have to do 10 minutes minimum of a audio book you know yeah. audible or or podcast just to get myself stimulated. And what I find from that experience is 40 minutes later, I'm still listening to the podcast because I get so excited. It's not exciting to go, oh, I'm about to listen to, uh, what am I listening to at the moment? I'm listening to. Uh, Better be rock, mate. Better be rock. <laughs> mate, it's the obstacle is away is what I'm listening to at the moment, but also the rock. <laughs> but, um, you know, I don't get excited when I look at that. I don't go, oh, yes, I'm excited to learn about that today. But I go, one of my non-negotiables is, I have to earn the right to listen to my music. So for those who are sitting at home like, and you know, everyone's entitled to do what they want with their time right now. But if yeah. you're watching a lot of Netflix or eating a lot of Tim Tams, like I'm doing or whatever it is that you're doing, I challenge yourself, invest the $9 right? and then just say, right, I'm going to do 10 minutes today. Yeah. Even if it takes you more than 14 days, 10 minutes today, I fucking guarantee you, when you get out the other side of COVID, you'll be feeling so much better. I promise you that. It makes your Netflix better because you feel like you've grown as an individual. Yeah. It, you just look for opportunities, mate. You look for, for avenues to, you know, and I'm one of them, mate. I've just gone through my 14-day journey. And if I'm 100% honest, I'll probably do it again, you know, because I'll find things that I didn't find the first time, you know. Um, I'm continually looking for things to invest in. You know, I have a gratitude journal that I fill out every day. I have a little scrapbook, mate, that I draw little figures in. I try to do things. I muck around in. I do noughts and crosses with if that's where my brain takes me, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to play noughts and crosses with yourself. You kind of, you don't know where you're going. But, um, but I, I just sit there and I go like it's, you know, like whether it's my program or not, it's, it's an opportunity, you know. And like I said, these programs, you know, for $9.70, like, I just sit there and go, do yourself a favour and have two less coffees because yeah. you know, like that's that's literally all it is. And if you gain one thing from it, then it's been worth it. And you know, you you sit there and exactly like you said, you know, um, I drive forty minutes to and from work. Well, not anymore, but I used to drive to and from work for forty minutes. And I had choices. I could listen to radio, I could listen to music, or I could start listening to podcasts. And if I'm honest, I used to listen to to radio flat out and music flat out and I got challenged by a few people at work that, you know, start to just invest in yourself in different ways. And mate, I'm the same. I, I read a podcast and I go, that does not interest me one bit. Press play and You're 40 fine. minutes later, I'm still sitting in this, the work car park listening to it going, <laughs> on, finish, 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 you know? So, you know, and, and like I said, I sit there and it's about growth, about learning. And I think we can learn every day. And it's something that my dad, and my mum. My grandmother, they all instilled in me was learn something new every day and don't be afraid to be wrong because that's the best way of learning. And I sit there and, you know, failure, failure is great. I, I love failure because, you know, you spoke to me about cold calling and, yeah. and doing these things and you sit there and go, you know, what, you know how many slaps in the face you're going to get, but you will learn from every one of them. And I sit there and go, that's what failure is. It's you've gone out, you've taken a risk, you've tried to do something that, you know, isn't comfortable. You've pushed yourself outside your barriers a little bit. Yeah, you've been hit in the face or you've been knocked back or whatever's happened, but you, you can then adjust, you know, give yourself the time to reflect on what you just experienced 
and go, right, part two, let's go again, but I'm doing it with a little twist. And you might get hit again, but you know, you keep figuring out a way. And you know, it's something that, you know, like so many people are scared of and I was one of them and still probably am a little bit, mate. I don't like to fail. Um, but you've got to fail to learn. You've got to fail to grow. And in failure comes the best growth. So why wouldn't you have a crack? 100%. Couldn't agree more, man. Well, yeah. one last question. And I never prep people for this question. Uh, what is your definition of being a man or a man? Ooh, that's, that's a... Well, I, love, I love asking it. I don't like preparing people because... I think it's cool to get everyone's perspective because you know, there's, you know, we, we got about 10,000 listeners at the moment a month mm. and I, the high percentage of those are males yeah. and everyone's got their own take of it. And there's a lot of men who don't feel comfortable being their authentic self because there is that stereotype. And I, I love hearing every man's unique perspective on what it is because it gives someone else out there the confidence to be themselves as well. Mate, if I'm honest, what does it mean to be a man? Um, I could go down very political ways, mate. I could go down very uh, structured ways and say all the right things and, and tick all the right boxes, mate. But if I'm honest, what it means to be a man to me is to be the best version of myself and pass that best version of myself onto those around me, my loved ones, my friends, anyone that I have contact with. I think being a man today doesn't necessarily mean you've got to be the toughest, the most macho the breadwinner, the thing. you just got to be the best you you can be. And I think... If you can tick the box and say, I'm being the best person I can be, then that's all we can ask. Because I learned from a young kid, give it all you got. There's always going to probably be someone better than you. There's always probably going to be someone stronger than you. There's probably someone smarter than you. There's always, you're going to find someone, you know. And I think right now, a lot of us men have to rediscover and redefine what success means to us. To us. My success has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with your listeners. My success is what means me here and here. And I think as men, we need to start redefining what success is for us, what it means to stop playing comparison game to the guy next to me, to the guy next to me, and just follow my path, follow that journey, be the best I can be, and help others on their path. Fuck, that's got me fired up, mate. I feel like I'm about to run out to the MCG. <laughs> that's, <funny. laughs> that's good. Um, it's, just, it's just something, mate. Like I said, I can't be more... I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. I'm not here to tell anyone how to live their life. But all I am here to tell you is be the best you can be. And, and I think that's, that's man, woman or anything, mate. Like, and that's all I ask. It doesn't mean you have to be the richest. It doesn't mean you have to be, the, like I said, the strongest or anything like that. Um, everyone's got a different definition of success. Everyone's got a different plan. And that's what's beautiful about this world, mate. We are all different. And, you know, I can't grow a beard. You've got a beautiful beard, mate. But, you know, yeah. If I sit here and compare myself to your beautiful beard, I'll, I'd be in a world of hurt every day. So <laughs> I've got to just look at this stubble and enjoy it, mate. And um, that's my path, you know, and I encourage every man to do that because we don't do it enough. And where can, where can people find you? Yeah, look, uh, obviously the business, um, businessfightclub.co. Um, get on there and check out the programs. There's a lot of great stuff out there. Um, and I think we can help a lot of people. Um, if you want to follow myself and, and stalk me Instagram, obviously um, at dArmfield27. I'm still attached to that number 27 because that's my footy number. That's that little <laughs> that goes back to that business card, mate. Um, <laughs> yeah, but like I said, if um, anyone, any one of your listeners um, ever want to chat, um, go through yourself, come to me, whatever. Um, like I said, I'm always here, mate. I'm, I'm no better than the person on my left, no better than the person on my right because all I'm worried about is being the best version of myself. Well, appreciate your time, mate. I got, you know, half oh, a fucking lot of notes here in disgusting writing that I have. <laughs> but uh, I look forward to uh, watching this back again. And I know a lot of men are going to get a heap of value for it. So thanks for giving up your time. I appreciate it. I know you're a busy man and uh, have to get out there and keep crushing it. Thanks for uh, all you're doing, mate. No, nah, thanks, mate. Appreciate it. And always, mate, never too busy for anyone. All right, team. There you have it. What another phenomenal episode. And I'm sure you guys got as much out of that uh, from learning from Dennis and how he's overcome obstacles and, you know, continuing to move forward uh, and just live to give. Like, I think that's such a great way to, to experience life and to move forward. So once again, guys, I really appreciate your, you all tuning in. I appreciate it when you share it, when you tag it, when you 
you know, just give it to people who you know will get value from it. That's how you can really help support uh, the vision and the mission of the Man That Can project and, and the podcast aspect that we have here. So once again, guys, thank you so much. And if you do, uh, or if you haven't, make sure you definitely subscribe. And if you have an extra you know, 60 to 90 seconds up your sleeve, please leave a review. It means a, means a lot. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Man That Can Project podcast. My name is Lockie Stewart, and I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it helpful. If you did, please take a moment to rate and review the Man That Can Project on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with our newest episodes. We'll see you again next time.